Hi, everybody. It's Tyler here at Championships checking in with Hall of Fame Team 359, the Hawaiian Kids. And every single year, Hawaiian Kids keeps raising the bar, building better and better robots all the way through. Uh, their intake system here is absolutely phenomenal. They have uh, four event wins already this year and absolutely rocking it in their division. We're filming this kind of late on day two in the top eight and looking for a great performance as we get ready for playoffs the next day as well, too. So, of course, we'll be breaking down so much in this robot. you got to love the compactness that goes into it and all the different areas. Some great stuff in terms of the uh, double cam bus that they're doing as well and more that you'll learn in regards to recordings. Let's find out more about here on 359 on Behind the Bumpers. This video on fun is brought to you by viewers like you and also in partnership with the following. Andy Mark provides superior service with the reliability that teams expect. Check out their sport gearbox and ratchet sport options to their tried and true compliant wheels used by teams all over the world. From mechanical and electrical products to tools and hardware, head on over to andymark.com for your one-stop shop of high quality and affordable solutions. True competitors know that every second counts. That's why Kettering University challenges you to dive in right away as a first-year student. Participating in robotics programs helps Kettering students secure a valuable co-op. Whatever your interest, Kettering gives you more space to work faster and win faster. Learn more at kettering.edu slash first. Chase, let's start to break down this robot here. We're gonna go through the arm and the pivot system first. So talk to me more about some of the composition of it. Yeah, so to start off um, with our pivot here, we have four motors powering our pivot on a 111 to 1 gear ratio. And then we have a chain that connects to this um, dead axle shaft that holds the whole arm up. And we're um, able to get um, the four motors just for, to get enough power and also for being able to get enough torque to climb. Um, going up to our arm um, system, we have two motors that run the extension of the arm. So Ernie, you can show how it extends. It's a three stage uh, arm with one fixed and two, um, two moving stages. So the first stage is clamped to the second stage with this belt here. And the belt is run from, or it comes from the chain and comes down and the, uh, the pulley here extends the belt out. So we have a, for our second and third stage, we have a rope that ties in, that ties in for it, it to extend. And that allows us to extend up to seven feet, which allows us to get to all four levels of the reef, as well as getting to the barge. Um, so talking about our arm, it, it's um, inspired from 2023, 2910's robot. Um, we used this last year as well, but for this year we found it especially good because it's very versatile. We're able to grab from the ground, from the feeder station, and also be able to grab um, from or score and grab from the reef. At what point in your uh, strategy process were you like, yes, this is something that we think is going to work again? Like, how did that come about? Yeah, so once we saw the game reveal, we had a, like a strategy and design discussion. And like one of our first ideas was to, you know, try out the 2910 arm again and see how it would do. We had to make some changes from what we had originally. So for example, to reach, we had to extend higher. So we made all stages of our arm around three inches longer which meant we have to we had to also make our drive base longer and that actually helped out a lot because when we're up high we would probably tip a lot but with the longer wheelbase it reduces the amount of tipping we have yeah absolutely makes sense on yeah. that super cool uh, let's pass it over to ernie he's gonna be talking about a little bit more on that intake system we talked about and a little bit on the uh, climber as well too i'd love to hear more about that okay so to start with the intake uh kind of through the start of the season and seeing the game we knew that we wanted to be able to do both ground and feeder station cycles um, just because the coral station isn't a protected zone uh, like previous years. So being able to have ground with having to deal with defense at some competitions as well as, as in higher level play, we really wanted to make sure that ground was a big priority for us. Um, but for this intake, it's both wide and we're able to pick up from the ground. So for our intake ground position here, you want to extend the arm. So it pretty much lays down on the hard stop and extends a little bit out of the uh, telescope and we're able to pick up coral in any orientation. Um, it first hits these black rollers and um, the corals on the floor and then gets kicked up by the green set in the back. Um, we have these two funnels here that are made out of aluminum that help to guide the coral into the center of our um, intake, um, as well as uh, alumin or polycarb plates on the, both the top and the bottom because this year's game piece can't really compress as much. Um, another thing is that our algae pickup is from the same mechanism as our intake. Um, which kind of 
the, um, gets rid of any like complexity with combining two mechanisms to one end effector. So we just saw that combining the both, both of these really is something that we wanted to do, especially because our arm reaches up to seven feet and can do both the L4 and the net. Okay, so moving to the climber. Um, so our climber here is powered by a uh, Kraken X44 that's connected to these two four inch wheels and pretty much the wheel spin and intake in the pole on whatever side of the cage and there's these two latches here that passively move when it's sucked in. Um, we recently switched to this design after a week five event after seeing that a lot of teams also had this and it was really fast and consistent. Um, actually before um, in all of our other events we had this climber that um, worked. It was in the same spot of our robot which uses the arm to grab and pull down to then climb. Um, but this climber is different because we had to get in between two poles of the cage and close the clamp. Um, this one was really reliable, but it did take more time with lining up and uh, having the driver really to know when the cage is clamped on. Um, but so we switched to this design so we can really kind of take more time to do cycles instead of having to maybe climb at 15. So now we can climb around 10 seconds and even below that. Um, something else here that's kind of linked in with our pivot is our ratchet that's on our arm. So when we climb, um, the arm is around here and kind of, so what this does is it's a servo that's on a latch. So the servo uh, actually it's the latch which it digs into the pinion of one of our motors on the pivot. So if you lower the arm, it ratchets down and when we're fully climbed, uh, the arm cannot lift. Um, we just added this around kind of the mid-season and build season because we just saw that the arm, even with a big gear ratio of 111 to 1, the arm would still kind of give after being disabled and we knew that we had to stay in the air three seconds after the match. Let's pass over to Leap and talk more about uh, some of the things the fabrication process has gone through. I mean, obviously trying to package everything the way that you've been able to do, so it's truly impressive for it. Talk to me about just what's gone into it from that fabrication side and then any of the challenges maybe to try to get a robot in this stature too. Well, I think that one of the things that makes our robot so special and what really helps with us being able to make these fancy designs like this is that we fabricate almost every single part on here, every single piece of aluminum we make in our own shop ourselves. And especially at the start of build season, you know, our design is always changing as we test out the prototype. And so my job in this shop is to help make pretty much all of these parts that you see here. I hope with the chassis and the standoffs and the bars and everything over here. Um, some challenges may simply be um, too many parts, right? Sure. Not having the manpower to fabricate so many parts in such a little amount of time, but also the skill level required to make these parts, right? A lot of these parts, like you see here, these plates and this tube especially, um, we use the CNC machine to make, right? The Fagor. And besides me and our mentor, Mr. Lenasco, no one else knows how to CNC. So when it comes down to CNC parts, we are pretty limited. What are some of the, uh, uh, you talked about, you know, your CNC for that. I know 359 has a very impressive setup at their facility. What are maybe some of the machines that you can find at 359's uh, facility? So in our shop, we have a water jet. We have two CNC machines, one of them being kind of older and slower. We have two CNC machines. Um, we have two mills, two lathes, and a variety of smaller machines like drill presses and whatnot throughout the shop. And Mr. Lee, actually, we got a new in like import of new machines. We have a CNC lathe and a whole nother CNC mill that we haven't even set up yet. So I'm actually, I'm really looking forward to, you know, seeing how those machines are wired up and getting to learn how to use them, you know? Very cool. Let's pass around to Morea and talk about on this, uh, you know, your auto alignment has been phenomenal uh, so far here at Championships. Uh, so we can't wait to hear more about that. And, but we were talking earlier, also running that double CAM bus as well too. I'd love to just have you detail a little bit more about truly what it is and how teams can maybe benefit from it too. Yeah, so we'll start with the alignment. So we have these two Limelight 4s on our robot um, and they're used for full field localization. And that's the biggest thing that helps us with the alignment. So. We pull our pose from this and we pretty much just do like a simple PID to pose um, with the rotation X and Y and that just helps us align very quickly. It's very accurate. And one of the issues we had originally this season was we have this limelight right here and this was running color detection for the pole. And it worked really well at our shop, but we found that when we went to our first event in week one, the colors were 
very different on the poles because um, First of all, we got the wrong color for the poles, and second of all, the lighting is very different in each of the arenas in comparison to our shop. So it was there was a lot of a trial and error with like calibration. It just didn't really work out in the end, and we wanted something a lot more reliable, so we had to upgrade to this, and it's worked pretty flawlessly at each of our events. And it requires minimal tuning, and it overall just keeps our cycle time quick and makes sure that our driver doesn't have to like really focus on the fine details of it. And then moving on to our CAN bus, Here's a little example of it. There are two wires running. So we have a purple and green line and a yellow and green line. And these are both connected at the beginning in the PDH and at the end by the Rio. And what this allows us to do is pretty much anchor into these two can lines. And that enables us to have like a layer of redundancy with our wiring. So if one of these was to cut per se, the one on the back would be able to back it up. Or if one of these was to be cut fully, it would be able to be backed up by the other line since it's still intact. And that just helps us stay like match ready and ensure that even if there's something that's wrong and we can't catch it, it's still able to run and stay like up to date and be able to go to our next match without any problems. So actually wiring this up and getting it all going like for a team that hasn't done this before, is that a difficult process or like how did you find it in terms of getting it uh, all together for your team? Um, if you use the start topology originally, it's not very hard to because you pretty much just double it up and then you connect it at the bottom, which sure. it's a little bit hard to crimp like the part that goes into the Rio. But other than that, it's pretty simple. But if you use daisy chaining as like your main can line, it might be a little bit hard to switch over, and especially since it's like not technically recommended to use start topology. But it's definitely something I would recommend because we've had it for over four years and we've never had a failure with it. So it's definitely something teams should look into if they can. Great 59, thank you so much for taking time to tell us more about your robot this year. Uh, overall, incredible packaging, incredible machine. Congrats on all your success that you've had uh, with your event wins. Uh, we're delighted to recognize you on the FRC Top 25, or the community is as well too. But here at Championships, looking great, and we can't wait to see how far you're able to go. So good luck the rest of the way. Thanks for taking the time. Thanks for watching. Don't forget to like, subscribe, and click the bell to stay up to date on future fun videos. True competitors know that every second counts. That's why Kettering University challenges you to dive in right away as a first year student. Participating in robotics programs helps Kettering students secure a valuable co-op. Whatever your interests, Kettering gives you more space to work faster and win faster. Learn more at kettering.edu slash first. Anymark provides superior service with the reliability that teams expect. Check out their sport gearbox and ratchet sport options to their tried and true compliant wheels used by teams all over the world. From mechanical and electrical products to tools and hardware, head on over to anymark.com for your one-stop shop of high quality and affordable solutions.